and we're live. Hello and welcome to Hershey Area All Things Diversities event, a conversation with Patty Kim. I'm Amy Ziegler with the Hershey Story Museum and Hershey Gardens and a member of our diversity group. Hershey Area All Things Diversity is a free series of programs to create awareness and promote acceptance and inclusion in our community. It is coordinated from by representatives from Derry Township, the Hershey Story Museum, Derry Township School District, Milton Hershey School, the Hershey Company, Penn State, Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, Hershey Entertainment and Resorts, and Hershey Trust Company. Tonight, we are very pleased to have as our speaker, Pennsylvania State Representative Patty Kim, who will be talking about her experiences being the first Asian American woman in the PA legislature and how her culture, ethnicity, and upbringing have impacted her career and personal life. At the end of our presentation, or her presentation, we encourage you to put your questions in the chat on YouTube and we will share them with our speaker, Susan. Thanks, Amy. My name is Susan Court. I'm a Dairy Township supervisor and a proud member of Hershey Area All Things Diversity. And it's a great honor to have our speaker with us tonight. We are pleased to have Pennsylvania State Representative Patty Kim, who's going to discuss her experiences being the first Asian American women in the PA legislature and how her culture, ethnicity, and upbringing have impacted her career and her personal life. Representative Kim, a former news anchor and reporter at Harrisburg City Councilwoman, was first elected to the State House of Representatives in 2012 and has been a leader in government reform and transparency. Leading her caucus's charge to provide a livable wage for all Pennsylvanians, Kim twice introduced bills to increase the minimum wage. Kim serves on the appropriations, education, insurance, and local government committees. She is vice co-chair of the Southeast delegation and a member of the Legislative Black Caucus. Prior to her work in the legislature, Kim was elected to Harrisburg City Council where she served two terms. She was elected as council vice president by her colleagues during her second term. Representative Kim proudly serves the 103rd district where she lives along with her husband, John and children, Brielle and Ryan. Welcome Representative Kim and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with our audience tonight. My pleasure. Thank you, Susan, for that kind introduction and Amy, thank you so much for um, opening up it up to us. Um, this is just such a, a treat to be here today to talk with everyone. Um, just talking about my story. So I, I just hope today is just in, um, informational and it's informal at the same time. And again, just so grateful that um, you're taking interest in um, the Asian American culture. So uh, again, my name is Patty Kim. I am a proud Korean American. Um, both my parents, um, well, my mother's from North Korea, actually, and my um, father was born in, in China, uh, but we are Korean American. And um, from the very beginning, um, when I was born in California, um, I had always felt that being Asian was a handicap, actually, and that um, something that I wasn't proud of. And um, my parents were children during the Korean War, the Korean conflict, and went through some really difficult things. I mean, I can't imagine um, what they had to see. Um, my mom's home was actually bombed um, by a, um, an American bomber. Uh, they wanted to um, bomb out the North Korean, I think it was the Mint Company. And so she went through some, some trials and, and tribulations. Um, but my parents met in California and um, we were born, my sisters and I were born in California. I've never been to Korea, actually, never visited. Um, and one of the reasons, and I don't, I can understand my parents' um, way of thinking, but, you know, they, it was, there weren't good memories back in Korea. So why would we go back? You know, they want to get away from all of the, the bad memories and start a new life. And we're, we're Americans now. And so, um, not knowing, and I was never proud of being Korean American, um, but trying to assimilate in this society, even though I look very foreign, you know, when um, people see me, you know, they, I remind them of the Chinese restaurant down the street or their dry cleaners or their manicurist. And, you know, it just, it's just another um, reminder that, you know, I, I look different and I don't, do I actually belong here? So, um, that has been a struggle. Um, when we were, 
um, young. We lived in San Diego for 12 years. And then my dad thought it would be a great idea to get into our station wagon, you know, with the wooden panels on the side and uh, travel to Northern Virginia, where I spent the rest of my um, middle school, high school years. And it was awesome. We went to all the national parks and uh, visited, you know, Mount Rushmore, Yellowstone and whatnot. Uh, but I do remember going through the Midwest and talk about sticking out um, tremendously in the, it wasn't very diverse, of course, um, I guess back in the 80s uh, in the Midwest. And I just remember this one time where my, we had to make a pit stop. My mom had to use the restroom. So we went into, uh, we parked and she walked into um, a public restroom and there were a bunch of high school kids outside of it. And um, she decided to go in. She kind of ran because, again, she had to go to the bathroom really badly. And um, after she went in, um, the door closed. The kids started making fun of my mother uh, in front of, you know, we're in the car and just making all of the, you know, the ching chong noises and the uh, mimicking her run. And, you know, she's small and petite. And I never felt so angry, you know, of course, it's your mother, you love your mother and just to be and I felt so powerless to see, you know, her just be so um, uh, mocked and um, that for a child for anybody, you know, number one, nobody wants to be different, but just it hurts your psyche that, you know, we're different, we're um, I don't know how to describe it, but we're, we're, we're beneath them, you know? And so you, you carry that, you carry that with you as a child. And um, so when we actually moved to North, Northern Virginia, there were so many more Asian Americans and you guys, um, my parents go to church and we went to a Korean American church. And I remember, you know, being in the service and being in a room full of people with black hair <laughs> where I finally didn't stand out. Oh, just that comfort that, you know, I'm not the only one. There are people who understand, you know, I may not even know them or like them, but I knew that we had common experiences and that was just so um, fulfilling. And so I spent the rest of my, again, middle school, high school years um, in Virginia and just being in a diverse, outside of DC, so diverse was uh, really um, just a, a better experience. Um, so, um, you know, my handicap slowly turned into a strength as I got older and realized that um, when I was trying to be a news reporter, they just happened to um, be looking for more Asian American women news reporters, especially in the DC area where I was growing up. And that was the first time where I felt like, oh, maybe this isn't, this isn't something that um, is a disadvantage anymore. And um, you know, I still don't know a lot about my culture, embarrassingly. Um, I try speaking Korean a little bit. I love the food. <laughs> I love Korean American food. Um, and we, you know, there's very few restaurants here, but that's something that I can be proud of. And um, I married a, a Caucasian man. Um, so I have biracial children, but I try to make them, um, you know, more acquainted to, to the culture. Um, and I'm, I'm going back and forth a little bit, Susan, Amy, I apologize. I'm a little bit under the weather um, right now. Um, but um, because I had that experience of being, feeling like the underdog, feeling, um, you know, I hate to say this, but like when, when guys, you know, start looking for girls, you know, you're never picked because you're just, you're not the typical, you know, type, you know, the brunette or the blonde or whatnot. And so just growing up, always feeling like you're on the sidelines has actually helped me um, in the way that I serve. Um, I, when I go into a room, I go to the people who feel disenfranchised. It's just natural for me. Um, you know, I know everyone grew up um, being different, whether you have freckles, you have red hair, whatever. But um, my empathy towards those people who don't feel like they're part of the larger group is um, the way I'm able to serve my community. And even though I may not have the exact experiences of an African-American person or a Muslim person, um, I have an idea. And I know that with my influence and with my position of power, um, I can come around um, and embrace them and, and make them feel like their, their voices are heard. 
And so I, even though I went through some really painful experiences, um, I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, nobody wants to be the only one sitting at a table by themselves in the cafeteria, just that kind of, you know, um, experience, I think is one of my strengths, uh, in leadership. Um, you know, growing up, I never wanted to be in, in politics or in government. I thought I would be, make a great nurse, but my nursing professors at Boston College thought otherwise, that um, I should not be <laughs> a nursing major. Um, but I always wanted that um, desire to help people. Uh, it's just innate in me. And um, somebody literally tapped my shoulder and said, hey, Patty, why don't you run for city council? And um, I thought that was something where I could help and, and serve. Um, so being the first Asian American, you know, on city council, the first woman um, as a state representative, it's not something that you make it your goal, but uh, I'm very grateful that um, my motives to serve got me in a position where um, I feel like I can do what I was created for. Um, so I know that uh, Susan probably has that same feeling of um, the service part, you know, we all have a hole that we carry and we have to fill it somehow. And my addiction is literally helping people and to uh, improve someone's lives or lessen someone's pain or suffering is something that um, keeps me going, even though politics can be such a uh, chaotic um, and uncomfortable arena. But um, when you're convicted to do something, um, that improves people's lives. It's, again, it's just super satisfying. So um, again, I'm all over the place. I apologize, um, but I would love to have more of a discussion instead of um, sharing like this. So if I can kick it over to you, Susan and Amy, thank you. Sure. Well, thank you, Patty. Those were beautiful remarks. And, and certainly um, everyone you serve should be very thankful to have you advocating for them. And you serve with your heart, which is what makes a good servant and a difference between a servant and a politician. So, so thank you for all you do for the people you serve. You know, let's talk a little bit, you shared about your, your experiences growing up and, and what your parents went through. You know, for some people, I mean, because our, our nation thankfully has become more enlightened lately, uh, although there's a long way to go, um, but this continuing uh, enlightenment and evolution has really cast a light finally on some of the plights that people in the Asian American community are going through. Some may think this is something new, but it's not. This goes back, you know, to the beginning of, of time when people from the AAPI community started to to live in our country, which is you know, probably a very, very long time ago. So talk a little bit just from your knowledge and experiences um, to educate people about you know, why this is coming to light now and, and really kind of the, the backstory so that everybody understands the, the history uh, and why this is still such a painful thing for so many people uh, in your community. Sure, uh, great, great question. Um, you know, the, the mentality, uh, so for example, when my father was a young child and, um, you know, the Japanese government wanted to kind of overtake the Koreans and, and you know, he was forced to have a Japanese name and to speak Japanese and, um, you know, thankfully, um, with the help of the United States, things were reversed. And um, again, we're just, you know, um, going through that conflict and then trying to get back on our feet and then going to a, a country where we just want, we're just so grateful to be here and we don't want to stand out. We don't want to make noise. We, we, our culture is um, modest, you know, it's, it's looked down upon to be, you know, um, uh, conceited and, and the show off. Nobody likes that, you know, in, in the Korean culture. So to be modest and to, to stay humble is something that um, we try to achieve. And so when you're here in the United States and you don't speak the language, you have an accent, uh, people see, like uh, compare that with, or uh, use it as a measurement of intellect. If you don't speak, you know, um, perfect English. And so our survival mode, and again, this is a lot of people who I'm talking about, but um, for my parents, you know, we have to survive. We don't want to make noise. We're grateful to be here. And then um, with that kind of mindset, we, bec we became kind of an uh, invisible community. 
you know, we're not, we're not active in government, you know, or politics and, you know, we're not going to protest anything. We're just, again, we're grateful to be here. We don't want to uh, make any uh, noise. And so, um, you know, my father and mom, my mom came into the United States in the sixties, but as time passed on and then the second generation like myself came, um, coming up through the United States, you know, we're like, mom and dad, like, no, like, you know, we have our needs, we have our rights and the way that you guys been treated, you know, is not right. You know, again, the, the mocking and the, you know, my mom had an accent um, and just had people just verbally like, you know, like, <sighs> like you don't understand, you know, understand. And, and, you know, if they don't understand the first time, you know, you talk louder, like as if we have hearing issues and we don't, and it's just very demeaning. And, and the second generation is like, we're not going to, we're not going to do that anymore. And so um, we've become um, more active and um, um, also wanting to give back because we have had a very good experience here in the United States. And um, I think of the uh, Korean war veterans who I uh, interact with off and on, and many of them are passing, unfortunately. But, you know, seeing their example of coming to a country that they may not have even heard of and to help um, my parents as children, they remember um, interacting with, you know, the GIs and some of the soldiers would give my dad candy or something sweet and just being really appreciative. And um, so anyways, just growing up, hearing those stories and wanting to give back and again, being really grateful for the United States and um, for being able to live here and have enjoy so many blessings and, and freedoms. So why do you think this has come to light now? Like what, what has happened in our, in our nation and our communities that has really cast more of a spotlight on the injustices done to the AAPI community? So um, one very um, public uh, incident that happened, you know, in Georgia where the um, um, women, the Asian American women were killed at the spa um, really sparked a lot of um, fear and outrage. Um, as I shared some of my stories, but I know a lot of Asian Americans in the, um, experience the same kind of subtle racism throughout our lives. Um, and, you know, some people have pushed back and said, Patty, not everybody, but I'm pretty confident that, you know, we have been picked out, pointed at, mimicked through, if you've been in the United States, you have been. And it's something that we don't share or talk about. I mean, it's embarrassing to, you know, to be uh, kind of insulted like that. So we keep quiet. And this is with a lot of other cultures too. And um, so we tolerate it. You know, we, it hurts, it's embarrassing and we let it go. And then when it escalates to women being targeted, we're just like, <laughs> You know, all of our emotions come um, kind of just surfaced and um, the fear that it could be us because we know that there's a small population of people who just don't like the way we look and who we are and, you know, in our culture that we're like, we, we're not going to sit back and be invisible anymore. And so I think, Susan, that was one of the uh, turning points for a lot of, we just kind of woke up and said, if, if we don't speak up, you know, the grandmothers and grandfathers, the Asian um, grandfathers being pushed during the COVID time where, you know, we were being blamed for the, the virus. Like we can't, we can't sit back anymore. So if we can use our voices where we don't have accents and then we are here, you know, and we are in prominent positions and we're, we're highly, some of us are highly educated. Um, we feel like it is time that we can um, push back on the things that our parents have tolerated for so long. I'm curious in your position during the past year when these um, crimes against Asian Americans and Asians, were you contacted by people, any constituents or community people talking about things that they observed or, um, you know, anything like that? I'm just curious if there were incidents around here that people are unaware of or that people were bringing to your attention. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of um, actually personal friends who have gone through some 
incidences during the COVID time where we've had a spike in those incidences where, um, you know, the calling out names and um, again, being blamed for the virus. Um, but because I'm the only Asian American in the House of Representatives, I obviously only had to step up and speak on behalf of all the Asian Americans in Pennsylvania. And that was kind of a um, surreal moment where it's like, you know, I know, again, growing up, I don't want to, you know, advertise that I'm Asian um, and I'm just trying to, you know, um, do my work and stay low and, and, and serve from behind. Um, but I had to stand up front and um, um, make sure that I wanted to let all the uh, AAPI communities know that they're being um, heard and supported and that we're going to try everything we can do to help and protect them. And um, I remember after the incident in um, Atlanta, Georgia, you know, just pulling my colleagues, especially the ones who have large Asian American um, communities like um, in Chinatown, uh, Montgomery County area, uh, Chester County, Delaware County, and just making sure that they are visible as well. Um, and just to acknowledge, you know, that um, there's probably a lot of pain and fear out there and that, you know, we want to be there to be supportive. So I did get people coming to me, not a lot. Um, but just having, um, a lot of zooms, we did a lot of zooms, um, and where people could just share some of their stories and, and mostly the frustrations that they've experienced in the past growing up as children and just really venting and, um, um, just making that little bit of a safe space where it was just really therapeutic to come together and, and, and share our stories. Amy. We can, mm -hmm. we can imagine that COVID just really layered on that much more stress than, um, what the community was probably already feeling and, and certainly what much more than, than the rest of the world was feeling. In your conversations with colleagues or friends or anyone in the AAPI community, what did you say to help lift them up and make them understand um, you know, their, their worth and to not feel beaten down by, uh, by the stress and the pressure of, of what was being said about the community during COVID? Mm, yeah. So, um... Having, um, again, just sharing our stories and especially in public places and having allies like yourselves to sit and listen and be like, you know what I had, and then I learned about stories about my friends that I didn't know, you know, existed as well. And just to have that, that bond or maybe a rebonding moment where we're like, yeah, we've gone through something, but we're going to be stronger for it. And I really, really wanted to point out that you know, guys, we're not the first ones, you know, after 9-11, our Muslim American friends were targeted hard, harder probably uh, than us. And so that this is a time to create empathy um, with Black Lives Matter, um, kind of the, the same thing of the fear that, you know, we could be next in terms of police brutality, that we need to use this moment to increase our empathy and be able to really uh, come together instead of in this, you know, us versus them and who's the um, more disadvantaged minority. Sometimes in these spaces, we're like, you know, no, we've been not us as Asian Americans, but, you know, we've been hurt more the Jewish Americans, you know, like who has suffered most. Let's let's not do that weird, um, you know, comparison, but let's come together and help each other uh, in the weaknesses. And and it's almost sometimes it feels like a passing of baton when it comes to the per people of color communities, you know, who's who's being targeted next. Uh, past that, you know, baton that nobody wants to, to hold. But I think it will make our community stronger if we can just um, empathize more with each other, certainly. You um, were talking about uh, before when we chatted about legislation and what, what role do you think um, state governments or national governments play in trying to protect really all minorities, but specifically the AAPI mm -hmm. community? And, and personally, what have you been working on that, that people would want to know about? Mm, sure. So during the Zoom meetings um, and um, having discussions with other communities across the Commonwealth, the one thing that I kept hearing from folks um, in the AAPI community is just to have more education, um, to have um, curriculum that celebrates our history and our culture versus just talking about all the wars and the dynasties and the very confusing, um, um, you know, leaders through the past and to celebrate our community, which so that when um, 
kids learn about it, that it's something positive. And especially uh, I've been there where, you know, you're the only Asian American in the classroom and everyone's staring at you when they're, you know, learning about whatever the Chinese government or whatnot. Um, but to, um, you know, make it part of uh, the curriculum. Um, you know, we're not, I have a bill that doesn't mandate this curriculum, but it gives um, schools the resources that have been approved by the, um, um, it's the governor's um, commission, um, advisory commission on a Asian American affairs, where um, we have materials and resources that's readily available. So it's really easy, you know, May is the, um, Asian Heritage Month, um, and that's something that we they can pull out um, conveniently and, and to teach and again celebrate the cultures, um, AAPI communities. Uh, but when it comes to reporting, you know we as community members need to do a better job. Again, as I was saying earlier, if we are attacked, um, a lot of people don't want to speak up or just want to you know push it under the rug and just hope that it goes away. We have to report these things so that police can have a record and see um, patterns or hotspots so that they can you know, respond. Um, but also at the same time that if you do report it, that somebody hears it and it's not just stuck in a folder and ignored. So um, we have to do better in terms of when it's reported that there's some kind of follow-up versus you know, whatever. I see, I told you nothing's gonna happen if I you know, reach out to the government. So we need to either prove that, you know, they're being heard and then um, also build the trust um, with police and the API community. We should mention too, um, that we do have some resources posted on YouTube uh, that are wonderful resources that our uh, Hershey librarian pulled together uh, okay. uh, with Asian American AAPI authors and, and different um, books that are suitable for adults and children uh, to learn more as we all try to continue that education. And I'm sorry, Amy, I know you're about to say something, so. You just mentioned the Governor's Commission on Asian American Affairs. I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about the kinds of things that they're doing. Sure, uh, so we have, um, oh boy, how many commissioners do we have? About uh, between 20 to, 30 commissioners and um, uh, from all over the Commonwealth. Um, they're usually community leaders. And um, there are different categories that um, you can choose to serve under, you know, government that works or education, um, um, awareness and, and whatnot. And we have different um, activities um, depending on the committee groups that you're in. So um, I was under the education um, committee and we had um, an issue where, you know, students were being bullied at school and then the parents didn't know what to do or where to go. And we wanted to put together resources for the students and the parents, you know, if there's a language barrier that we would have a translator, um, that um, we have a support group to make sure that students don't feel alone. Um, you know, I'm grateful for Dairy Township and that it's becoming more diverse and that you have the Hershey Medical Center attracting a lot of different folks, you know, coming into the area. And I think that's so healthy for the community to see different people and um, the ones who are, you know, in a minority community, that they have other people to not feel so alone. Um, I'm sure, you know, all school districts have issues and can do better, um, but there is also, you know, um, safety in numbers. I hate to say that, but, you know, um, my kids went through middle school and are still in high school right now. And I just know how um, things can be um, in schools. Um, so anyways, um, I think just having those who are targeted or picked on, um, bullied, that they um, have resources and a, a safe place to go, somebody who understands um, those issues. So those are the kind of things that we are working on with the commission. I think we could think of it too as like comfort in numbers, not just safety in numbers, but just that that That's sense right. of like I belong, which is so important. Um, you That's know, Patty, right. so many we did this last uh, last time we had a, a session when we talked about understanding the Hispanic and Latino community because we wanted people to understand that it's not 
it's not one group. It's not, they're just not from Mexico. They're not from Brazil. It's really from everywhere. I mean, different, different groups that make up that larger community. Similarly with the AAPI community, a lot of people watching may not understand what that means. So could you just provide a little background on what AI, AAPI means and, and where the countries of origins might be for the people who, um, who represent those different groups? Sure, yeah. So AAPI community is a very large umbrella um, when it comes to um, um, including all different, you know, uh, nationalities. Um, you know, we have the Pacific Islanders um, all the way to um, um, South Asia where we had, you know, the Indians. Um, so uh, I think we represent about um, 50 different nationalities under the API communities. So it's very diverse. Susan, you're correct in that. And um, um, we try to include, you know, everyone. And I'm still learning all the different nationalities as well. Um, and, um, you know, historically we've had, you know, some tension or, you know, um, um, disagreements, you know, um, when it comes to the Korean War conflict. And so, you know, the new generation is just trying to be very open-minded and knowing that, you know, um, we need to just be more inclusive. Um, but so Susan, I don't want to just name all the different countries in Asian America. <laughs> There'll be, be a other. quiz at the end. We want all 50, Patty. <laughs> so, but it's very, it's, it's a lot broad, you know, band of uh, uh, cultures and including, um, yeah, I, I just, anyways, I'm not going to list them, but yeah, sorry. You've uh, talked a little bit too about um, you know the importance of understanding and being a good ally. So for the people watching this and all the people that they will subsequently talk to, what's important in being a good ally to someone in the AAPI community? What what should we know, and what can we help others to know? Sure. Um, so I think um, you know being curious, you know, the reason why I'm in this business is because I love people and I love to learn more about people. And, you know, even when I was a news reporter back then, just asking a bunch of questions to be open-minded and curious about them. And we all know that the, you know, um, everyone cares about their families. And if there's, you know, if you can't find anything to connect with, um, talk about their families. And then you can go from there and just asking questions. And um, uh, all I can keep saying is being open-minded. Um, you know, even within the Asian, the API community, you know, I was invited with my job. I get to go to so many different events and cultural events. And I remember going to a Pakistani event and just, um, you know, I felt, I felt different from them, obviously, by just looks alone. And so there felt like a division, like, oh, they're different and I'm different. And there was really no connection. And I didn't know how to react. I didn't know how to really um, uh, interact with everyone until I saw a young lady um, during the program talk about her, um, what she was doing. They were very proud of her. She was a college, she's a college student and talking about the things that she's studying and what she wants to do. And instantly she reminded me of my daughter. And then that's where I felt like the connection, like, of course, of course, you know, um, she's just like my daughter and wanting to, you know, do certain things and to be successful and whatnot. So trying to find that one uh, commonality, something that you can relate to, I think can really help us um, to bond. Cause you know, um, the different, you know, the different dresses and the smells of the different food can make you feel like you're really different. But if you just lean in and be curious about them, I think is the, is the best way to start, Susan. So you mentioned, Patty, that your generation is sort of handling the stresses of being a part of the AAPI community differently than, than your parents and, and they differently than their parents. What about your children? What about that generation? What do you see in them uh, that maybe inspires you as they go forward and try to affect change like you are? Oh, okay. Um, well, the first thing that came to my mind is that um, I just, um, when I had my grandmother live with us when we were young and I was pretty fluent in Korean, but when she left, so did my Korean. 
And uh, I never really picked it up or tried to um, learn Korean. My daughter is like, I'm learning Korean. Where's a Korean class? And just went full, like she speaks better than me. And this was all on her own with, you know, Korean tutors and she takes Korean classes and cultural classes and she wants to know everything about um, the, you know, the, the Korean culture, which I'm so proud of. And, you know, um, you know, I'm regretful that I wasn't able to teach her more, but she, she's like, move over mom and I'll, I'll figure it out and, and do it. She'll teach own. you. <laughs> <laughs> so embarrassing. Um, but, um, and I think uh, that just like myself, I had the best of both worlds, um, being in America and um, having the freedoms and options and, you know, just the, who just all the blessings that come um, being American. And then also having a rich culture where um, I, you know, we do certain things like every other culture, you know, on New Year's Eve or uh, New Year's Day, we'll have like rice cakes to that represent, you know, long life and whatnot. And I get to have a whole other side where I can actually pick the things that I like in my Korean culture uh, that I'm most proud of. Um, again, for I mean, for example, you know, respecting our elders, uh, family is super important, working hard and and things like that. And just pulling the things that I admire the most about my culture. So getting the best of both worlds. And then so with my daughter, um, just seeing um, that diversity is, is right now is, is you know, um, praised, I guess, or it's, it's valued and that she can be unique in her own, in her own way. Um, she is kind of, you know, struggling a little bit, what, you know, being biracial, but, um, she's, she's doing well. And, um, again, taking some of the Korean culture and, and running with it and, um, enjoying being different. Yeah. Proud of her. I'm sure you are. And it's great to be learning from your children. That's a wonderful time when that, that switch flip, this flips yes. and you realize, Hey, Hey, like I learn something from my daughters every day. So just embrace that. It's a great thing. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah, you're right. That's so true. Yeah. I, I want to give a shout out too to Tom, one of our viewers tonight, who um, took the time to actually put on YouTube definitions from Wikipedia of uh, the different oh, groups thank that you, represent. Tom. So thank you, Tom, for doing that. And also as a reminder, we're, we're getting ready to wrap up. But certainly if you have any questions for Representative Patty Kim, please feel free to put them um, in the chat on YouTube and we will make sure that we share those questions with her as we, as we wrap things up tonight. So um, Patty, to take us take us into the future if you could, like what, what kind of is um, your vision for how the AAPI community uh, is celebrated uh, in, in your daughter's lifetime and, and her children's lifetime? Like what, what do you hope for the future and what part do you see uh, you know, yourself and your family playing in that? Mm. Oh, great question. Um, so I just, um, I was recently in Scranton and the state rep there was telling me about the culture um, when he was growing up where we had the immigrants were the Italians, the Irish, you know, and they had their own little cultural wars. But then he said, Patty, what brought us together was love and that they were intermarrying. And then they realized, you know what, it doesn't matter what country you're from, um, we're all the same. And I just want us to uh, continue that where uh, we're integrated. Um, we, we, the tribalism, we, we cut away the tribalism and find ways that um, can unite us um, in whatever um, our passions are. Um, I think our next generation is a lot more open-minded in terms of, um, you know, we don't put ourselves in different categories too much. Um, and that if we can just um, see past the outside, the skin color, I think we're gonna be better off. I am encouraged by, um, especially the kids, my, uh, my kids age, I don't, you know, know a lot about the others uh, age students, but um, the, the teenagers now, they still have issues, but I think they're a lot more open-minded than my parents' generation, so I'm excited. Uh, but when it comes to Asian uh, American um, moving forward, I just I want them to um, jump into all arenas, you know. Um, and you know, I'm biased. You know, I, I think that we need more voices in government and in politics um, because we can speak on more than just our our culture. We can speak on behalf of a lot of people, especially 
um, the people of color communities, persons of color. So anyways, I'm excited. Um, I think we're all changing and having programs like this and just hearing personal stories, you know, it's time consuming Susan and Amy and putting this together, you know, but just to make this a, a priority or put this on the list of um, things to talk about is I'm just super grateful and that, um, um, that, that this can spark an interest and that we have the tools to be able to connect with other people that may not look like us. So well, thank we you. are very, very grateful for you and, and your time. And thank you for being a part of this together. We're all shifting the conversation and, and I know brighter days are ahead because uh, our children's generation, they are not comfortable with the status quo and they will make things change much more so than the change that we've all experienced in our lifetime. So that's promising to look forward to for sure. So thank you. Pat. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Amy, very much. Yes, thank you. And we really appreciate this. I know it's hard for people sometimes to just go and ask questions on their own. And this, I think, is a nice entree for people to learn more about it and be a little bit more comfortable moving forward. So that's really wonderful. Um, I do want to thank, before we say goodbye, the Hershey Company, who are going to be, if you haven't already received it, sending you a really nice big basket of chocolate. So, oh wow, <laughs> I'm excited! Yay! So, so is your staff because they're yeah. listening to this too. <laughs> oh boy, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we always want to thank them for that. So keep an eye out. Um, we are going to be getting together soon to plan our upcoming sessions for the new year. So um, keep a lookout for an email regarding those and we'll be getting back together soon. Awesome. I hope I to just, see you guys in person next time. Really thank excited. you, Patty. We should mention one more thing because as a, a small thank you for your time, we did make a, a, a donation to a charity of your choice. Would you just tell us a little bit about the charity? Yes, yes. It's called, um, real quickly, it's called Tears for Trina. Uh, she was a victim of domestic violence and the funds will go to help women who are trying to escape um, a bad situation and, you know, maybe a hotel, a night at a hotel uh, to keep the women and men safe. So I appreciate uh, you making that donation for Tears for Tarina. Definitely. I checked it out today. It's a really wonderful organization. Yes. Thanks, Amy. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Good night. Good, Good night. night. <laughs>